migration, which is facilitated by migrant smuggling networks, has resulted in the loss of thousands of innocent lives, be it in the North African desert or the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the modus operandi of such uh, networks has never valued human life. Uh, and, of course, these were only being driven entirely by profit. What we are up against is a huge, lucrative, multi-million euro business. Earlier this month, at the opening of its new European Migrant Smuggling Center in The Hague, Europol reported that in 2015, criminal gangs generated between 3 billion euros and 6 billion euros in people smuggling records. The EU agency's director, Rob Wainwright, pointed out that almost 90% of the more than 1 million migrants who entered the EU illegally last year used a so-called facilitation service to get to Europe, in most cases provided by criminal groups. As is the case with any business, the migrant smug smuggling circles seek to satisfy an existing demand by supplying the required product or service at a good profit. Rootless organized criminal networks have over the past years exploited the plight of millions who are in search of a new life away from civil strife, terror, and misery. They abusively transport them across borders and between continents for a hefty price. They essentially treat these people as goods packing them on board, often unsuitable vessels, showing no concern whatsoever to their safety and lives. And when I say packing them, it's, it's really packing them. I have seen photos and uh, very much so indeed. On a side note, regrettably, the other important and immediate challenge facing the European Union and the global community is that of terrorism. The recent attacks in Belgium, Iraq and Pakistan have all claimed innocent lives, lives lost to a misguided and perverted ideology. So currently we are either discussing terrorism or discussing migration. Since the year 2002, Malta has experienced an irregular migration phenomenon, with migrants reaching our central Mediterranean islands by boat or dinghy, mainly from the shores of western Libya. The craft used by smugglers are often loaded beyond capacity, further to being old or of a poor quality. This is confirmed by the fact that many of those who landed in Malta did so upon being rescu rescued by the assets of the armed forces of Malta that are responsible for search and rescue matters. Nearly all the boats that ended up in Malta, pursuant to, to these voyages, intended to reach the shores of Sicily or the island of Lampedusa. Therefore, although Malta was often on the front line, it hardly ever was an intended country of destination, as you said in the beginning. As a matter of fact, even many of those who managed to reach Italy sought countries further up north. In the year 2002, over 1,600 irregular migrants entered Malta. Although such a number may not sound impressive by European standards, it has to be borne in mind that Malta is the smallest and most densely populated member state in the European Union. Its territory is of only 316 square kilometers, whereas its population exceeds 400,000. Moreover, the influx experienced in 2002 was not a one-off phenomenon, as the numbers of arrivals remained high over the following years, peaking in 2008, where the number nearly reached the 3,000 mark. So we had to invent open centers, detention centers, schools turned into detention or open centers, and of course, to give them the necessary help, medical and uh, even other services. The difficulties faced by Malta were compounded by a number of factors. First, by the fact that nearly all arrivals took place in the summer months, which placed significant strain 
on our reception capabilities. Secondly, nearly all persons entered irregularly applied, applied for international protection, which meant that for a number of years, Malta ranked first or second among the industrialized, industrialized countries worldwide in terms of asylum applications received per capita. Such statistics have been compiled and published by the UNHCR. Therefore, even though migrants did not perceive Malta as a country of destination, many sought international protection in the country and were indeed recognized as being in need of such protection. In this regard, it was also have to be pointed out that a very significant proportion of those reaching the country irregularly originated from unstable regions in the Horn of Africa. As a matter of fact, over 7,000 of these migrants were Somali and over 3,000 came from Eritrea. In view of this, Malta not only received many asylum applications, but also many applications that resulted in recognition of protection, mainly subsidiary protection. Malta's asylum recognition rate often hovered above 50% and on occasions even reached higher percentages, including up to 80% as well. So irregular migration therefore resulted in Malta having to bolster its reception facilities as well as its asylum determination capabilities. Significant investment was made in both systems, including through the utilization of European Union funding mechanisms. Furthermore, the Maltese government is constantly reviewing the relevant mechanisms with a view to improving them. In this regard, government has recently reviewed Malta's reception policy, whereby the system is now less reliant on detention and more focused on open center accommodation. The Ministry for Home Affairs and National Security has in fact published a national strategy for the reception of asylum seekers and irregular migrants as recent as December 2015 a publication that was preceded by a consultation phase. And even here, a number of NGOs took part in the consultation process. One of the, one of the primary objectives of this strategy is to ensure that Malta's reception system, including detention, is fully compliant with the EU recast um, reception conditions directive, as well as recent European Court of Human Rights judgments pertaining to Malta. Several re reforms have been introduced through this strategy and complementary amendments to the Immigration Act and the Reception Standards Regulations under the Refugee Act, including the introduction of criteria for the pursuance of the detention in respect of asylum applica applicants, as well as the establishment of a system of initial reception for those who enter Malta irregularly. This short-term accommodation arrangement allows for the proper processing and medical screening for those who enter irregularly. This includes the process to determine who should be detained and who shouldn't. The document also provides for accommodation arrangements for minors in lieu of detention, of course, arrangements that provide for initial reception at a, dedica a dedicated facility, followed by accommodation at open reception centers suited for the needs of minors. Hence, the strategy provides for a humane approach to irregular migration, an approach which does not, however, rule out detention in view of national security considerations, particularly where this is required to verify the identity or nationality of persons who have entered the country irregularly and undocumented. This, in my view, contributes to a balanced approach to irregular migration. Over the last two years, Malta has experienced a reduction in the number of persons reaching the country irregularly, mainly in view of maritime operations taking place to the south of Malta's search and rescue region. However, this has not resulted in a corresponding decrease in the number of asylum applications. In fact, during the year 2014, 
Malta received a total of 1,283 new asylum applications, whilst in 2015, the number of, of applications received was significantly higher, standing at 1,716. During these last two years, recognition figures have also remained high, with most applications received having been filed by Libyan and Syrian nationals. It is therefore true to say that Malta is still on the front line when matters are seen from the international protection perspective. But not only, because our armed forces are uh, on daily, uh, are being called to, to save lives um, at sea. In fact, only last week they had uh, our particular offshore vessel spent uh, about um, 72 hours on three or four different missions. So I think it's quite an achievement for, for them. And I'm seeing uh, well, oh, your. Um, military here as well. Notwithstanding the pressures that Malta continues to face, it has immediately agreed and contributed to the European Union's project for the relocation of asylum seekers from Italy and Greece. In this regard, the first asylum seekers from Italy and Greece uh, were received uh, 15 from Italy and 6 from Greece, all Eritrean, have already made their way to Malta. The implementation of this project will continue over the coming months, and we're trying also to accelerate this, 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 this process as is requested by uh, the European Union. Malta's participation in this project is in line with the government's stand, where, whereby it has always contended that whilst the provision of financial and technical assistance is important, and of course always welcome, this does, this does not necessarily fully address the challenges faced by member states. It should also be noted that Malta will also be taking part in the European, European Union resettlement project through the resettlement of a number of asylum seekers from outside the European Union, mainly coming from Turkey. And this is a first for us uh, in terms of resettlement. In June 2015, the EU launched a military operation in the southern central Mediterranean, better known as UNAFORMED or Operation SOFIA, which is based in Rome. The aim of this military operation is to undertake systematic efforts to identify, capture, and dispose of vessels, as well as disabling assets used or suspected of being used by migrant smugglers or traffickers. Malta fully supports this initiative and has contributed to it since its inception. In fact, we are planning to keep contributing through specially trained personnel from the armed forces of Malta. At the same time, we look forward to Libya establishing a stable government, which is also crucial in terms of countering both migration and terrorism. Malta is wasting no time in showing solidarity with other EU member states who are directly affected by the issue of unauthorized entry into their territory and is steadfastly committed to a common, fair and sustainable EU approach where all member states pull their weight. Practical solidarity between EU member states through migration burden sharing has been advocated by my country for years now. Time and again, we have stressed the need for a permanent mechanism to alleviate the problem faced by border states, such as our islands, in case of a migration crisis. Malta and a few other countries have in the past years kept fighting for Mediterranean migration to be placed higher on the EU agenda. It has taken the European Union quite a while to get its act together on this issue. A veritable search for a European solution was only sought with the situation or when the situation reached crisis point and started being felt by more member states. We have finally managed to at least, to at least sit around the table and focus on a common way forward. No EU country 
no EU country is in a position or should try to deal with the migration issue on its own. And I think the experience of Germany now uh, is, can vouch for this. Neither should any country at the Union's external border be left to carry a disproportionate burden as a result of its being the first port of call for migrants. The recent past has shown that this does not work, apart from the fact that it puts in jeopardy the very core values of solidarity and unity and diversity that under, underpin our union. We must continue working together in order to further secure our extended borders, in so doing, saving the Schengen area. We must go on addressing the root causes of irregular migration and forced displacement in the countries of origin. The recent EU-Turkey agreement was perhaps the first time that we, as EU member states, seriously come together in a bid to destroy the people smugglers business model, at least in the Aegean Sea. Traffickers are in this for the money. So if we want to discourage them from pursuing their activities further, we must render their abominable activity unprofitable. It is essential to make this happen if we really want a durable solution to this thorny issue. And the best way to do it is by removing the demand for their services. The joint EU-Turkey action plan provided some breathing space to both sides to address the unprecedented migration <coughs> crisis emanating from the Western Balkan route. This deal, which also aimed at breaking the business model of traffickers and smugglers along that route, provided an effective mutual response to this crisis in conjunction with EU cooperation with partner countries in the Western Balkans. All this brought to the light how important cooperation with neighboring countries is to the holistic effort to address migration flows. However, we need to be extremely careful here. As happens in any business, migrant smugglers will not simply throw in the towel, pack up and go home, but will instead seek ways to adopt to the new situation. There have been reports that, faced by the closure of the Balkan trade, traffickers are luring migrants towards alternative routes. The International Organization for Migration has warned that the Libya to Italy route is getting very, very active. Hundreds of migrants have already been rescued at sea in the central Mediterranean zone in the past days. And figures show this, especially when one compares the current figures with the previous year. Last month, Malta cautioned against measures that will simply shift migratory pressures from the Aegean to other routes, such as through the Adriatic Sea or the center of the Mediterranean. On the 10th of March, I told my colleagues at the JAJ Council meeting that this means looking at the collateral effects of every measure we take. It is for this reason that Porta is insisting that aid is given to other countries too, should they be adversely affected by a shift in migratory routes as a result of the Turkish trail being, being clogged. EU citizens are frustrated by the current situation, which is largely a result of a lacking implementation of EU decisions in the past years. As I had the opportunity to, to tell my colleagues at the Council of the EU recently, it is now more important than ever for, for member states and EU institutions to avoid political posturing, unilateral decisions, decision making, and nationalistic entrenchment. We must all work together as a single team. While progress has been made at an EU level, political leadership and the long-term coherent vision to address migratory pressures on the EU remain absent. I cannot emphasize enough the imperative need to move beyond crisis control and to make progress on all aspects of the comprehensive approach, including 
a truly common European asylum system, beginning with the reform of the Dublin system. And there is no place, a better place to say it than in Dublin. <laughs> From Walter's point of view, one of the main challenges remains the conflict and instability in Libya, as it is from its shores that the bulk of asylum seekers taking the central European route depart. The focus is at the moment on Greece as the main point of entry of unauthorized migrants into Europe. <coughs> However, the central Mediterranean route is still active and should not be ignored. We must leave no stone unturned in order to achieve stability in Libya, so as to finally have a single, reliable interlocutor in this important neighboring country. Whilst the asylum process is of utmost importance, we have to remember that a significant number of those who enter regularly are not entitled to international protection. Such persons, of course, have to be returned to their respective countries of origin. In this regard, one of the key obstacles faced by the Maltese authorities is related to the fact that most of the migrants reaching the country irregularly are undocumented. When trying to effect the return of such migrants, Malta sometimes, or most of the time, I must, I must say, faces lack of cooperation by certain countries of origin, mainly in the form of lengthy delays in issuing the travel documents to return their own nationals. Over the years, Malta has made several attempts to return migrants to various countries. However, notwithstanding several contacts made via diplomatic channels, only a few countries reply with regularity. The vast majority of requests remain pending. By means of apposite EU funding, Maltese authorities have implemented a number of projects to strengthen cooperation with relevant countries of origin. Furthermore, efforts were made to provide favorable, assistant voluntary return and readmission programs to improve sustainable voluntary return. No one can question the importance of properly addressing the issue of migrant smuggling today as opposed to tomorrow as well as to enhance the element of solidarity in response to the ongoing migrant crisis. It is an unfortunate reality that, as things stand today, the crime of migrant smuggling remains a low-risk, high-gain option for the perpetrators. <coughs> it is only the victims or the users of the service, of course, with an inverted commas, that are confronted with a high risk high cost option, as they are enticed into spending their life savings on a trip that may very well be their last. At the same time, we also need to be stronger in the asylum sphere. Here it is the principle of solidarity that offers the key to the proper way forward. We also need to improve return figures so as to send a strong message against the viability of a regular migration as a way to enter Europe for economic reasons. Regre regrettably, this is not an easily achievable objective. However, success in this sphere is essential in parallel with the establishment of proper legal immigration opportunities. Let us remember that at the end of the day, the EU does need immigrants. Our working population is declining. For the time being, we can, generally speaking, still manage to keep our economy growing by encouraging more elderly people to stay in the workforce and more women to enter it. In the medium to long term, however, the EU will need to attract a significant number of immigrants from beyond its external borders. In the words of Jean-Christophe Dumont, an expert on migration, at the OECD, and I quote him, for now, we can make better use of migrants who are already here, matching their skills better to labor market needs. In the longer term, it will not only be about matching skills, it will also be about numbers, unquote. 
that lifeless body of a three-year-old Syrian boy washed up on a Turkish beach. Of course, uh, a shocking image that has become <coughs> iconographic, I believe. is seen by many in Europe as depicting the problem, when the toddler might very well have been part of the solution. Last November, the Valletta Summit on Migration was held in the Maltese capital, Valletta. It brought together more than 60 European and African head of state and government in an effort to strengthen cooperation and address the current challenges, but also the opportunities of migration. It is important that the political declaration and action plan agreed at the Valletta Summit are implemented. It's also a question of credibility of us in Europe with Africans. That action plan was design, designed to address the root causes of irregular migration and forced displacement, enhance cooperation on legal migration and mobility, reinforce the protection of migrants and asylum seekers, prevent and fight irregular migration, migrant smuggling and trafficking in human beings, and ensure that the partner countries work more closely to improve cooperation on return, readmission, and reintegration. During the Valletta Summit, the leaders also agreed a list of 16 concrete actions to be implemented by the end of 2016. I'm not going to list them. The, exist the existing mechanisms of the Rabat process, the Khartoum process, and the joint EU-Africa strategy will be used to monitor the implementation of the action plan. Therefore, I wish to conclude by pointing out that Malta has traditionally perceived itself as a country of emigration rather than one of immigration. Yet, the last few years have seen a radical transformation of migration realities in Malta. I think that this is one of the reasons why migration remains such a controversial issue, which often prompts a very emotional response, as well as very emotional language. It is, however, important for us all in Malta and in the rest of Europe to approach migration logically, without forgetting our human rights, obligations, and our humanity in the process. In the past few minutes, we have turn the spotlight on the Maltese perspective on migration from the island's position at the southernmost border of the European Union. I hope that my presentation has served to provide a better understanding of the situation from a central Mediterranean, <coughs> Mediterranean point of view. <coughs> Therefore, I thank you very much for your interest and attention, and now I look forward to answering any questions as you may have. Thank you. Thank you.